I think I'm on. Am I on that? It's going round and round. The things are going round and round. Oh, I think we're here. Ooh, I forgot lipstick. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the gathering room. This is Martha Beck. Yes. Who the hell is Martha Beck? It is I. Ah, uh, okay. It, oh, I'm live and there are peoples here. Hello, Alexa, how are you doing? And Denise and Libby and Emily and Anne Corinne from Lillehammer, which is so amazing. How are you guys today? I don't know how much of my run in where I was saying things that make no sense really makes it to the live broadcast, all but of all of it, all of it, I've been told. Yes, but we're doing this as a special podcast thing, so I say, welcome to the gathering room. I am Martha Beck. Yay! And here you are. There's 115 of you. Oh my gosh. Libby, I just have to name some names. Cynthia and Donna and Lori and Catherine and Emily and everybody. Christina and Kristen and Stephanie. Ah, oh, you guys are wonderful. Balm to my heart. Here we are together again. And there's 164 people, so I'm just going to start. And if you missed the first part, I'm really sorry, but I hope you can catch it on the recording side. Also, love from the distinguished badger, Rowan Mangan, who's oh. behind the scenes for a while, but is sending much love to all of you. Okay. So today, I, well, today you can find at Maria Shriver's um, Sunday paper, which is her online sort of newsletter that is marvelous, um, you will find an article by me and it is called, it's about recovery. The theme of the Sunday paper for this week was recovery. And I was asked to write an article on spiritual recovery. And I thought to myself, we really aren't at a point where I'm thinking about recovery very much. There is a lot going on in the world right now. The COVID-19 cases are still going up. Uh, the mortality is still going up. Uh, the economic damage is still increasing and nobody's really talking about recovery yet. We're sort of treading water as fast as we can. But then I went and looked up the word cover and I realized that it can mean take cover. It can mean shelter, it can mean protection. And that got me off reading about how we can take shelter from even things that are happening right now. And I used you guys, the gathering room, as a place where I take shelter from all the, the Sturm und Drang of the, of the world. And I thought, you know what, since these people give me sanctuary, I want to talk about sanctuary with them. So I don't know if you remember seeing um, on a movie or whatever, somebody running into a Catholic church in Europe in pre-modern times and shouting sanctuary. For most of like the middle ages, that was all you had to do to get protection from even legal authorities who were pursuing you for like murder. You could get away with pretty much anything as long as you ran into a church and yelled sanctuary. There was one queen who took sanctuary in a cathedral with her, I think seven or eight children and actually had a baby all inside this cathedral while a bunch of enemy soldiers were all around. They would have come in and killed her and the children, except she was granted sanctuary and everyone in the society, even the soldiers on the other side of the political lines, acknowledged that when you said sanctuary, you got to be in a sacred space and you were safe. So I went into the anthropology of this and even the biology of it all over the world. I didn't know this before this week. In every culture going back all the way into very, very early times from what they can tell, every culture has a tradition of what they call a sanctum sanctorum, a, a, a holy of holies, the most sacred of sacred places. And every culture has had a physical space that was a sanctum sanctorum where if you went there, no one could hurt you. 
So they say, uh, who was it? Who was it? Robert Frost who said, home is where when you go there, they have to take you in. Some of us have had home experiences where our families weren't the ones that took us in. But there is in each of us, in all of us, an almost, they call it a primordial sense. Anthropologists call it a primordial sense of some place existing that is a holy of holies. And even people who don't have any spiritual beliefs still have this in their, in their deep in their psychology, that there's a place where when you go there, no one can hurt you. And I was thinking that's, that doesn't even apply anymore. Um, there, there isn't any place that you could go to be safe from the things that are happening to us now. We've got a virus that's going into all our buildings and spaces. We can't see it. We can't fight it except by trying to avoid it, something we can't see. There are voices being raised against systemic oppression. And what I keep realizing, the more I read and the more I listen, is that it's everywhere and that I have been so unaware. I thought I was aware. I was so unaware of how pervasive oppression is and how pervasive my privilege is. And like waking up to that day after day as I read and I listen has been heartbreaking. And I think it should be heartbreaking because horrors have been perpetrated on many people and not long ago, like today. And you can't actually know that that's happening without a sense of horror and heartbreak and a sense of there has to be sanctuary. There has to be a place where no matter who you are, no matter what you've been through, when you go there, someone takes you in. If there's not that feeling, I just start to cry just thinking about it. Like the people who don't have that, it's distressing. So here's what I wrote in my article. And here's what I hope you listen to. Even if everyone around you is upset at you, even if you are trying to fight a virus that you can't see and that we don't have any drugs to fight, the one place you can go that is a sanctum sanctorum, sorry, I'm so emotional about this. It's the part of your psychology that is connected with the divine. Um, I've pointed this out a few times, but this is this painting that I did is a painting of the forest, but it's a forest drawn on the map of a cathedral from um, medieval Europe, or I guess they'd still make them that way. There's St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. And the whole idea is that for me, the forest is sanctuary. I go out there. But if I just go out there and sit in the trees, it doesn't work. The reason it's a sanctuary is that I can, oof, every time I think about this, I, I just tear up. <clears throat> you know, this stuff has just been stripping my heart down. So many people suffering. It's when you really pay attention to it, it's, it's all of us suffering. It's all of us being hurt. It's all of us being looked down on and oppressed and ignored. And it's the part of my heart that is sanctuary can't stop crying for it. And I don't want it to. It's not that I want to feel better. Oh, please don't cry, Martha. You need to cry sometimes when people are in so much suffering. But the reason I'm crying isn't the suffering. The reason I'm crying is that after years and years of suffering in that way, I found a sanctuary and it's in my connection with the divine. Oh boy, I didn't expect this, you guys. I've never done this before. There was one time I did this. It was when I was teaching at Brigham Young University while I was getting my PhD from Harvard. And one of the students, um, wrote a letter saying that I wasn't sufficiently Mormon and that I had, that I was a godless woman and had no connection to the divine. And they, had, they took me in and um, read that to me and they had snipped off the bottom of the letter. So I didn't know which student it was. And I had to stand up in front of my students day after day, not knowing who was writing the letters. And I actually broke down and cried trying to talk to those students about my experience with the divine, but you guys aren't them. You guys are wonderful. So I'm just talking, trying to stop crying. 
because here's what I want to tell you. If you have a special time and you have a special place, my place is just a simple chair. I have a little meditation space that I, you know, with it's great. I mean, I'm so privileged and blessed at this point in my life, but I don't use that. That's not the space where sanctuary can find me. It's just a little inconspicuous chair in my house, but it's comfortable and it's stable and I can look out the window and see trees. So you need a space that's safe and comfortable and it's the same every time you go there. That's really important because you will drop into what a psychologist calls state dependent memory. Um, and that is that your body, your psychology will follow the feeling of a space. So if they give someone a, an injection of insulin, if they have diabetes in a room that has a black zigzag on the wall, and then they take them into a room that has a black zigzag, their insulin will go up even if they don't get the shot. So I go to my chair and my chair is in the corner, but the window is in the middle of the room. So I push my chair over to the corner and it's a biggish chair, so it's not easy. But this is the other thing. You need a place, you need some time, and you need a ritual that puts your body and brain into the state dependent memory where you're now going to seek sanctuary. So um, pushing my chair over to the window has become part of the ritual. It's the same thing I do each time. Then I sit down, I tuck in my blanket around me just so, and I open the window and so I can hear birds and things. And then I, um, maybe I read a little bit from books that inspire me or whatever, and then I meditate. And if I'm lucky, I get an hour. If I'm not lucky, at least I take a few minutes. But once you have that, you have your designated time. And this is time where you don't have to think. So even if your heart is breaking, even if you've just read a whole bunch of things about systemic oppression in our society and you're just shattered by it, even if you have loved ones who are sick or you're sick yourself. This is a time you don't have to think about it. You don't have to go into regretting the past or fearing the future, not for this time. And if all you can give yourself is five minutes, say, I will not think during this time. I will just be okay. And that's all you have to do. You sit down and then all meditation is is saying, I am here now and I am okay. I am here now and I am okay. I'm here now and I'm okay. Now, if you say that long enough, you're going to connect with the part of yourself that is always okay. And that part of you, I've talked about it endlessly. I think that part of you is your spirit because it's not going to die. It isn't born. It doesn't die. It is life flowing into form when you're born and flowing out of form when you die. But it's always connected to everything. It is always life and it is always love and it is always healthy. And it is always at peace. And it's always in a state of love, always. <sighs> I'm going to try so hard not to cry again going into this. Because <sighs> when I sit there and it's like a channel opens up and you say sanctuary. And you can bring the other people with you. <laughs> You can put your arms around them. You can comfort them. You can say, look, in this place, if you come into my heart, I will always take you in. Because the power that is my life will always take me in, as inadequate as I am. There's always love. There's always safety. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what's been done to you. Something there picks you up and holds you. And it's real, you guys. It's more real than the horror. It's more real than the illness. It's more real than the economic distress. It's more real than racism. It's more real than all those things. It is the only real thing. And it wants us all to come home to it. It wants us all to go into the doors, walk into the cathedral and say sanctuary. And whatever they do to your body, whatever they do to your life, 
They can never take sanctuary from your soul. They can never take that away. No matter who you are, no matter what's been done to you. God. Between the letters people have been writing me and the books I've been reading. Uh, it's a lot more people to take in with me than I ever thought. You know? So that is my... Whew, I didn't, I, I did not think I would crack up like that, but the takeaway, designate a space, designate a time, go to it the same time every day, do your little ritual, ask for sanctuary, and then go in to the place that says, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. And the less okay you are, the more distress you're in, the more power there is in connecting with the, the part of you that is always saying you're okay, you are good enough. You are whole, you are invulnerable, you are perfect. You are. It always knows that. You've never been anything else, even despite all the stuff that happens in human life. So that's my whole thing. And if you ask for it every day, you get it. And there's always that place to go. And now I will take questions if anybody is, um, <laughs> is okay. Um, talking to me when I'm in this kind of a state. All right. Oh, uh, here we go again. Somebody says, bless you, Martha. Connection to the divine is huge. Marianne says that. Hi. It's been so hard. The divine loves you so much. Sending a hug. Waking up to the suffering of um, black, indigenous, people of color. Hurts, dear one. How can we give our suffering selves and others a sense of the divine? Um, <sighs> Well, I guess that's what I've been trying to say. You, you, you take in more pain and suffering and then you go back to your sanctuary and it's not just you going in, it's taking other people in. One of the wonderful people who wrote to me, her name is Bev, I forget her last name, but she made this video called Slave Voices. And if you look for it, it's just a little three minute video and it's James Earl Jones and he's reading the account of a slave, a man who was enslaved. And talking about being bought and sold three times in one day or something. And um, uh, if you go watch that and, and you let all the boundaries melt and you become that boy being sold away from his parents. And I don't think we've really changed much, frankly. Um, if you go in there and you become that boy and, you t and then you find sanctuary... I think, I think what it does is it gives you the strength to be more present for the people who are still being treated that way, essentially. And again, I'm not, I'm not so emotional because I'm upset. I've been upset forever. <laughs> I'm emotional because when you go home and you've been in a place that's so terrible, and you go home with someone who's been through agony like that and you watch the love fold around them. You feel the love folding around that boy being, being sold. When you feel how the divine loves that boy, that that is, I can look at horror Without cracking up, I can be really tough. I can be really tough. But that kind of love just undoes me. It just undoes me. And I hope we all go there because it's it's wonderful. Oh, Donna says, Martha, what can we do if it's hard to figure out that place, time, and ritual that makes us safe? What if we don't have a space that is without other people? A long time I did this in a one-bedroom apartment. In the bathroom or literally a corner and you push your chair over the corner and you I would hold a book up I grew up in a house in a two bathroom house with 10 people in it it was a small house and especially for 10 people but I could hold a book up I was like it's how to be an anti-racist I could hold the book up like this and I used to walk with books in front of me because it helped me feel sheltered from the world um so you can create um, Ro always says when she was traveling the world as a 
as a young person, she would just take a sarong and she'd go into youth hostels and hang up this one piece of cloth on a lower bunk and then she'd have a little cube and that was her sacred space. You can make sacred space if you just say, I'm going to. Find a way to do it. Put up a piece of cloth, put up a book. There is a way that you can find a sanctum sanctorum because it's always just about space to go within. Okay, so pa Pamela says, you give me permission to actually feel the emotional toll that is there. Thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah, the evil is, is overwhelming. And then the love that is trying to come through you guys, this is the thing. Sorry, I didn't mean this to all, be all about the, the oppression stuff. It's also about the, the economic damage, the COVID stuff, everything. But here's the thing. The love that comes through to heal a wound that deep is more than I've ever felt. And that is the surprise for me. That's what makes it okay to still be a human on the earth, or I would have checked out decades ago. So yeah, feeling the pain of it is big, but don't ever stop with the feeling the pain. Go into sanctuary with the pain. And it's when the love comes for that pain that you start to understand how huge love is. And that's when I just can't stop crying. <laughs> okay, so um, Emily says, or Emily Elizabeth says, I feel so deeply connected to myself and spirit. Why do I resist sitting still? I don't know, Emily, for you, but I know for me, it's because right now something's happening, like right from the beginning of the pandemic, because and I've told you guys this before, but in case you haven't been there, when I painted that cathedral picture, it was because I was writing a novel that I still haven't written about this man who's in the painting. And he goes to the cathedral of the forest for sanctuary um, because there's a pandemic and the center of the pandemic is Manhattan. This was the novel I was going to write. And then God decided to write the same novel and kind of scooped me. But um, there's, I was trying to feel for what wanted to happen in the world. And in my book, the plague was going to be a plague of awakening that people were going to wake up. And COVID has done some waking up for sure. And it's changed the way we behave a little bit. But when the wave of, um, of self-expression from oppressed peoples came out, I feel like the, the pandemic almost broke, like broke the earth so that seeds that had been planted could grow up. And the transformation of human consciousness that I believe is meant to happen in our lifetimes. I hope, I don't know. It's just a thing I've always felt since the time I was little. Um, something consciousness is trying to evolve right now into something that better than humans have been before. And I believe that the, the wave of, um, of speaking out is the first sign of the, the human consciousness actually changing because you can get sick and die of COVID-19 and not have a change of consciousness. But the oppression didn't seem to have a direct or the speaking out against oppression didn't seem to have a direct correlation with having COVID-19. It's something that came into the break where the culture was now pausing and the momentum was less. So I think we resist going to a place of stillness because it right now it will shatter the ego. It will absolutely shatter the ego. And that's, you're seeing me completely coming unglued because my ego, I hope the shell of my ego is shattering and I'm, I'm breaking down a lot of assumptions of privilege and all those things, but I'm also unable to shield myself from the love that just undoes me. And I think when it comes up hard, I just wrote about this in the book that I just sent off to my publisher. The first time it happened to me strongly, I had I, I was so upset and disturbed by the energy in my body that I went to the mountains and I ran and I stood under this huge waterfall because the there was this electricity coming through me and I was emotionally feeling quite strange and having these torrents of ice water coming down on my head felt like it balanced it. And I was like, <sighs> because I was being broken open and filled with something like electromagnetic like light or energy 
Um, so I think we're afraid to sit still because right now consciousness is evolving in all of us and it means shattering identity and it means you cry in front of people and it means that you take in the pain of, of people whose pain you hadn't known about and it's big, it's huge. And we have to sit still anyway, but not for the suffering, for the sanctuary. To go all the way through it to the sanctuary, that's why we need to sit still. Um, Alejandra says, how to commit to the ritual? And she says, love you when I love you back. Um, for me, it's because my heart needs it or I can't function. I get either stale or I get too um, complacent or whatever. I, I can't be comfortable in the world without going into sanctuary. It's too, it's too crazy and mortality, you know, death waits at the end. So if I ever get complacent about life, there's always death to wake me up. And so whenever you're suffering, go there. And that's all you need to do. You don't have to have some big self-punitive discipline stuff. Just go when you need comfort. You don't need to go every day to get an A+. Plus. You go anytime you're hurting. And if you're hurting enough to open to love, there it is. There it is. Never, ever, ever says you're bad for not coming here earlier. It never says you're bad for not knowing this before. You are perfect to it, and you are it. So Sandy says, how do you define the divine, or do you? I don't. I don't at all. I just believe there is a power greater than myself. And I believe that whatever is alive in us, whatever is consciousness, is something that I don't understand. I've done a lot of reading and, and seeking for the definition of consciousness. It is just that which knows. And it's, it got tangled up with physics about a hundred years ago. And I've never found a physicist who could tell me what it is, but consciousness and God and love and truth, they all are one thing for me. So that's ill-defined, but that's as close. It's whatever, it's whatever, when you go there, it always lets you in. <laughs> that's what it is. Um, Marianne says, how can we still have hope when there's so much uncertainty? Um, hope is kind of the definition of uncertainty. Hope is really allowing that not, it's not just bad things may happen. It's, we don't know. And if we're really uncertain and we are speaking of physics at a very basic level, uncertain, even of what a particle is, then something amazing might happen. So you have to go into each moment saying, I don't know what could happen next. At the moment of my death, something astonishingly beautiful could happen. And there's hope in that. If you say there's no hope, then you're not uncertain. You've committed yourself to a faith in despair. And that is as unprovable as a faith in leprechauns. We just don't know. So go where the heart wants to go because it's steering you somewhere. That's what I have found. Um, Jules says, I have a prayer or meditation closet. Yes, I used to go into a, not a very big closet either. I would go into the closet, I'd close the door, and I'd put pillows around me, and that was a sacred place for me. It was a, sacra, a sanctum sanctorum. Bossia says, can you talk about the novel you're going to write and why the story interested you at this time? I wrote a book called Diana Herself, which was about um, the awakening of the divine feminine. And the next book, there's three books that I want to write. One is about the divine feminine. One is about the divine masculine. They all exist in each of us. And the final one is about how we come back from destroying ourselves as a species on the planet. Um, I haven't started the second novel. Well, I had, but now this pandemic has changed everything. So I have to go back and rethink it. But ultimately, I think that there will be a transformation of consciousness in my lifetime that those who are on the bottom of the social period, who are, uh, period, pyramid, who are suffering more have the most motivation to crack the system. And so uh, the people at the bottom levels of the pyramids that we've created with socioeconomics will start to wake up earliest. And there will be a sort of ripple effect. If you wanna go look online, there's a YouTube thing I put up years ago called the pyramid and the pool about how I think social change may work at uh, at the, the brink of our own self-destruction. So let's see if I get that written or if the, the novel writes itself in the world before I get to it. Um, Jessica says, I've been feeling physically heartbroken because of people's suffering. Can you shift this 
specifically the physical ache. Yeah, you can go in and I'm just going to reiterate a little. Go in and allow yourself to want comfort so deeply that you surrender to your longing for comfort in the brokenheartedness. And when you can touch the part of yourself that's saying, I love that, I love that broken heart, then you're connected to God and everything shifts. And you may cry and cry and cry, but it will feel more like you're dissolving than like you're hurting, like the hurt dissolves in tears. So let yourself cry and the ache, which I think comes from the physical constriction around the heart, it goes away because of, because you've surrendered to love. And that's the only way I know. And Stephen finally says, how to practice self-care when we feel so depleted we can't figure out how? I'm so with you, Stephen. Lie flat, I often advise my clients. <laughs> Lie flat and let that be your sanctum sanctorum. And go in again to the aching of the heart and inside the pain is always a yearning for healing. And inside that yearning is the truth. And the truth is that what's praying is connected already to the part of us that's being prayed to. And the part being prayed to is something that is beyond the physical, that can enter the physical through us, through our broken hearts. And it enters as love, healing, a broken heart. And that is the thing that evolves consciousness. So if we're feeling broken and hammered by the world right now, go lie flat and ache and hope and yearn and let yourself surrender to the belief that there is a place where when you go there, you're always loved, you are always accepted, you're always taken in. It's real, guys. So I love seeing you here and I'll see you there as well because we're all there together in that gathering place. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I love you guys. Thanks for putting me up with me crying like a moose for a long time. Mwah, mwah, mwah. You're the best. I love you.